much for giving us the opportunity to, to speak about this. Um, I was asked to look at the experience of Red Cross Children's War Memorial Hospital as a possible model for how the NHI could work, because it's a public sector hospital that sees both private and public patients. Um, and trains um, health professionals. And so I'd like to start off by, by looking at that. Um, so can we have an image of the first slide? So this is the uh, slightly unusual view of the Children's Hospital because it's taken across the Rondebosch Common. <coughs> the, um, can I move this on? And just to remember, it's a war memorial. The, the hospital was started by public subscription when some returning soldiers from the Second World War decided to establish a war memorial. And they decided they didn't want a statue or uh, something like that. They thought a children's hospital would be more appropriate as a war memorial. The Red Cross Society was not really very instrumental except as the channel of the funds. Um, so people contributed the Red Cross Society kept the money and the hospital was built and it was opened in 1956. So it's a teaching hospital attached to the University of Cape Town <coughs> and um, also linked to the University of Stellenbosch and it's a leading center for the training of health professionals, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists and so on um, for the country and for the world. Um, so we train undergraduate students and postgraduate pediatricians uh, who are general and, and subspecialists. In other words, people interested in specific organ-related diseases. I was one, I was, I'm a pulmonologist, so I'm interested in um, respiratory disease plus a few other things. So does the Red Cross Hospital give us a good model? And I think, um, which, which way do you go forward here? This one? Okay. Thanks. Okay, so the Children's Hospital is um, a center located in the Cape Metro West um, district, region of the Cape province. And you can see there where it is on the map. It uh, caters for a population well, it, does, it, it, it works at different levels. It works as a regional hospital for that region and caters for a population of about 651,000 children who live in that region. The under five mortality rate in the region is 18. <coughs> Sorry, 16.8. Uh, compared to the, the countries now, which has come down to 42, mainly because of the success of the prevention of uh, maternal to child transmission of HIV. But it's also a national hospital because it takes referrals for the sort of higher levels of care from around the country. So in 2012, there were 22,500 admissions to the hospital, uh, a death rate of about 8%, and that's high because of the um, severity of illness. Now, where do the people come from? They come mainly, I'm talking now about the public sector patients, come mainly, and, and they more than 90%, um, if not more than 95% of the hospital um, admissions. So they come from areas like this, where uh, the, t you know, the, the townships around Cape Town. <clears throat> and um, that's the patient care side of it. Uh, Teaching hospitals, academic hospitals, have to do four things. They have to provide service, which I've discussed. They have to do research. They have to teach. And they have to do advocacy. Advocacy is a relatively new thing. There's a traditional kind of three stools of service, teaching, and research. So I've discussed service. Now I'd like to go on to teaching and research, which is um, a bugbear of mine. So at UCT, which is what Red Cross Hospital is linked to, um, the relative weighting of teaching and research is 
heavily skewed towards research. And that's easy to understand. There's huge money in research, you know, and some of it is completely, in my view, irrelevant. It's like comparing one little steroid versus another little steroid for, a blocked, for blocked noses. Nothing to do with what the country needs, but big money. Now, so this balance needs to be restored into something more equitable. I'm not saying research is all irrelevant, but a lot of it is, and it's pointless. Even the relevant research is pointless unless it actually gets to where it makes a difference to people's lives. Now, the teaching side of most universities, this applies around the world, actually, um, is undervalued. And teaching is, um, is kind of, we, 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 we teach the way we were taught. You know, there have been big advances in the way people learn and acquire knowledge and produce knowledge, which is not really um, uh, benefiting health professional education. So recently in The Lancet, there was a big article on training health professionals for the 21st century, which I won't go into now. But you know that the, um, David spoke about re-engineering primary health care. And that is the, the sort of basis of the national health insurance proposal. Robbie spoke about the importance of developing a health system and that actually what we're doing is working out a way of providing the country with a kind of health system that um, Henry Gluckman visualized in the 1940s. I'll say a little bit more about Henry Gluckman because I think Robbie didn't really give him full justice. Um, but this is the primary health care approach. Maybe you can't see all of it, but the top of the pyramid is the hospitals, like the children's hospital. Then you go down through different levels of the health system. And you have to get into households. You have to get into community. And Gluckman spoke about what he called the modern conception of healthcare. And by that he meant moving out of the hospitals and closer to where people live and into households and looking at the causes of disease and ill health and the causes of the causes, getting deeper and deeper. And um, our current crop of health professionals just can't do that. You know, that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to provide technical medical care to people who are already sick. And so if we get the NHI right, and we also um, extend the thinking that Robert was speaking about to other sectors, then this is possible in this country. Um, so why is it so important to look at the causes of the causes? This is a picture I took recently in Kailicha. This shows some children playing at a standpipe. That is the water supply to 400 people in that area. And as you can see, it's surrounded by filth. Um, this, is, this is not 20 minutes from where we're sitting now, is where the conditions under which people are living. Um, so this brings me to the issue of inequality. Now, I'm afraid I'm going to repeat some of the stuff that David has said. This slide I made a few years ago, it comes from the presidency. It shows you in the blue and green bars the income of the richest 10 and 20 percent of South Africans. And if you use a telescope from the back there, you'll see two little brownish dots at the bottom. That's the income of the poorest. 10 and 20% of the country. This gap is a time bomb. You know, nothing is going to work unless we close this gap. Nothing. Everything will fall apart. And um, again, uh, this is a recent study by Labrant and others <coughs> that shows you, um, if you, if you look at, this shows you the cumulative share of the population, from, you know, and the cumulative share of the income. And if we had an uh, equal country, we'd follow the straight line so that 10% of the people get 10% of the income, 50% get 50%, etc. Um, but what you can see is the extreme skewing of the income, and it <coughs> compares 1993 with 2008. And it shows you that it, things are getting worse. And why are they getting worse? Because at you know, inequality is increasing at, amongst all groups of the population. Um, 
what you can see is that for African people, colored people, Asian people, white people, income inequality is increasing. It's only that little tiny bracket, the richest, the richest of the rich, that are having the, you know, the growth in South Africa. We've seen spectacular growth since 2004, sorry, since 1994, since the um, democratic election. But it's really gone to the richest 10%. And if you look, you'll see that for all other centiles, the share of the income is actually decreasing. And this is one of the reasons why um, inequality is bad for everyone, because people get anxious. Inequality is a source of stress, major stress in society. It's stressful to the poor because they're worried about their relative position, but it's also stressful for the rich because they're having to close themselves behind security systems and gates and closed circuit television cameras and barbed wire and stuff. Everyone suffers if there's inequality. Po poverty is bad for health. And, but the, the, the gains in health you get from increasing wealth only last up to a certain degree if there's also growing inequality. Um, sure. So why is inequality, I mean, some of the impacts of inequality, and this comes from the child gauge um, produced by the Children's Institute at UCG, and I see Catherine Hall's in the audience. Okay. Who, um, who did a lot of the analysis of the data. And this shows you how inequality impacts on people. You know, if you, um, in the richest 20% of households, no one goes hungry. And as you look down, you'll see that in the poorest, you know, the, the difference between access to water, um, I'm talking now, sorry, about children in the country. Um, inadequate sanitation, overcrowding, being having inaccessible health facilities because it's too far from home. It's always worse for poor people who already have the biggest burden of disease. And uh, I'll skip some of this. Um, there's inequality into provincial inequality, which is shown here. David showed this data, which is the impact of various forms of inequality on infant mortality. Access health facilities from the poorest to the richest people. This shows the number of children who live too far from a health facility. And as you get richer, you know, it becomes more accessible. David spoke about the, um, the in inequitable system division of health resources between private and public. And here you can see it again. Uh, so I won't go into this in detail. But what I would like to speak about is the fact that we live in an unequal society, and the question we're discussing is whether a decent health system can produce more social solidarity and more equity. Robbie believes it, I believe it. But we have to fix the health system. One of the things we have to fix in the health system is the inequality within it. What this slide shows is the difference in pay, salary scales in the public sector from the top management down to the lowest level of workers. There's 16 scales. And the richest, um, the people at the top, earn 27 times more than the people at the bottom. This is one of the biggest inequalities in the world. And this makes for sickness in the health system. You know, uh, we all know about high levels of absenteeism, about nurses behaving badly towards patients. Why? They are living under tremendous conditions of stress. They themselves are not healthy. This thing has to be fixed as well. And then to go back to Rwanda, and we're looking at Rwanda now because it's recently um, become an example of what happens, can happen with the National Health Insurance. Rwanda instituted National Health Insurance recently. I forget exactly what year they did it in. And they adopted social policies following the genocide that focused on the health system. I'm talking about health policies now. And also focused on reducing inequalities. They haven't got there. In fact, inequalities are still high in Rwanda, but not nearly as high as ours. But um, there are lessons to be learned there. 
Now, just to remind you of how rich we are and how rich Rwanda is, this shows you uh, uh, GNP per person for South Africa on the left. Next comes Rwanda. Next is the average for the WHO, the World Health Organization's Africa region. And then next is the world. So South Africa, our gross national product is slightly less than the global average. But Rwanda is about a tenth of ours. And if you remember that um, in 2004, the same year that we had our first democratic election, they had a genocide. The country was, sorry, 1994. The country was devastated. Nothing worked. Under five mortality went up to the 270s. 270 children born died before they turned five years old after the genocide. The health system was in tatters. Epidemics were rampant. Yet David showed this and David showed this, but I want to spend a little bit of time on this one because um, this shows you our pro, you know, the red arrow here shows you the time of our election and their genocide. And look at what they've achieved. They're much poorer than we are. But this is just stunning. I mean, the, the under five mortality rate has, is now equal to ours in a very short space of time. This is possible. This is possible um, because it's happened. And how did they do it? That's, um, that's where the lessons are. And maybe we can discuss that. Um, so the Rwandan health minister said this. She said, prioritizing equity in the health sector is not only a moral imperative, but uh, also an epidemiologic and an economic one, if we want to grow as a nation. Now, um, to get back to our situation and to the kind of country, the kind of society that we want to build and that we can build, I believe, if we get our health system right. Um, the, um, I believe that a, a decent health system can promote social equity. But I would like to, and I'm sure Mark's going to talk about this, um, the NHI is a bit of a black hole at the moment. None of us know what's going on. The whole idea about um, health systems and health system development is that there should be strong community involvement. There should be transparency in how it's done. It's happening behind closed doors. It's, we, we don't have a clue. Why is the white paper, which has been promised, not emerging? Uh, we, can th we can kind of speculate, you know, this is a danger when things happen behind closed doors, that people start thinking the worst. And the worst, I think, and maybe it's the truth, is that there's a fight going on behind those closed doors between people with vested interests who are benefiting from the current inequitable system and who want to continue benefiting. Um, and, you know, we... We have now, I think Robert made this point very clearly, a historic opportunity to develop a health system in this country that will benefit everyone. This happens about once every generation. My father had it. My father was a doctor, by the way. Um, he was around when Henry Gluckman made his proposal. I don't think he ever even knew about it. You know, and certainly I never discussed it with him. But since that time, and that proposal, interestingly enough, when the British government was looking at the post-war situation in England, and they were thinking about a national health service in England, the health minister, his name is MacDonald, is that right, David? Okay. Um, saw the Gluckman Commission recommendations and said, this report tells us what we must do. And they developed the national health service. We threw it out in the rubbish bin, essentially. First with the provinces, and then when the apartheid government took over. <clears throat> so, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the NHI is uh, something that all of us should be interested in, and that all of us should be advocating seriously for a national health service, a single national health service that treats everyone the same. And I think I'll stop there. 
and hand over to Mark.